All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's keep going. Iroh is implementing a new intervention to increase his nephew's ability to manage his emotions when frustrated. The intervention involves providing verbal praise every three times his nephew uses a frustration tolerance technique. Over a few weeks, Iro notices his nephew is managing his emotions more effectively. What is the independent variable? When we think about independent variables, independent variables, we're thinking about what are we manipulating or introducing or removing, and what are we trying to affect or change? Whatever we're manipulating or introducing or removing is going to be our independent variable. Whatever our target is, whatever we're trying to change or affect is the dependent variable because it is dependent on what we are doing. In this case, Iroh has an intervention to increase his nephew's ability to manage emotions. So essentially, Iroh's dependent variable is the nephew's ability to manage emotions. That's what we're trying to change. What does Iroh introduce? Well, he starts providing verbal praise when his nephew uses techniques to manage emotions. So what Iro is using or introducing is the praise. So what is the independent variable? A, the nephew's ability to manage emotions. Well, that's what we're trying to affect. That's what we're targeting. So that's going to be the dependent variable. B, the verbal praise is what we predicted. C, the frustration tolerance technique. We don't know where those frustration tolerance techniques came from. We know that Iro is giving the verbal praise. That's what we know. The nephew, however he's managing his emotions is how he's managing his emotions. We know that Iro is manipulating the verbal praise. That's our independent variable. And then D, the effectiveness of the intervention. Well, effectiveness has nothing to do with independent or dependent. That's just gonna demonstrate some sort of functional control. In this case, the independent variable is going to be the verbal praise. A music instructor wants to get a better idea of how long her student is practicing each day. She tells the student to start a timer as soon as they start practicing and to stop the timer if they stop practicing for more than 30 seconds. What is the instructor using for measurement? When we're thinking about measurement questions, we want to ask ourselves a couple of things. One, is it continuous or discontinuous? In this case, the music instructor is telling the student to start a timer, and when they stop the timer, after they stop practicing for more than 30 seconds, they need to record whatever they measured. So whenever the student is practicing, they are measuring. That's going to make this continuous. Every instance that we can, we are going to measure. Second, you want to look for things like how long or how many. How many implies a number, a count, right? A frequency. How long involves or implies some sort of time. So if the music instructor wants an idea of how long a student is practicing, what is she going to use? A, duration. Duration is going to let the instructor know how long the student is practicing. The student starts a timer when they start to practice, and then they stop the timer. So that is a discrete duration from start to stop of how long they're practicing. B, time sampling. We're not time sampling here because we are not breaking into intervals, right? We're just taking the whole time that the student is practicing. Same with interval recording, which are both discontinuous. With these measurements, we're going to break our behavior or target into intervals and take a sample of data. Here, however long that student practices, we're going to measure that whole duration. And then into response time. Into response time would see the music instructor asking the student, how long does she go in between practicing? So from practice one to practice two would be our answer response time. But just practice one duration is what we're looking for. So what is we what are we using for measurement? What is the instructor using for measurement? It's going to be a duration. In an effort to improve their training program, an art school is keeping track of how many attempts it takes the newest group of students to draw four perfect circles in a row. Which measure of efficiency is the art school implementing? All right, back-to-back -back measurement questions. Doesn't concern us, the order of the questions, what type of question. 
answer the question in front of you, get it right, move on. So we're measuring efficiency. On the new task list, they talk about measures of efficiency. And in this case, there's a training program and it's keeping track of how many attempts it takes to master four perfect circles in a row. So if we're looking at how many attempts it takes to master something, what are we looking at? A, training duration. Well, like we talked about in the previous question, the, the question is asking about how many, not how long. So how many implies a count, not a duration. Be a cost-benefit analysis. With a cost-benefit analysis, you are weighing the benefits against the cost of an intervention or a strategy. We're not doing that here. We have a strategy. We just want to know what are we measuring. B, C, frequency. Now, they are likely taking frequency of the attempts, right? But what's the measure of efficiency? The measure of, of, of efficiency is going to be trials to criterion. We're going to look at how many trials it takes to get four perfect circles in a row. So if we have something like this, where check marks are correct, that would be six trials to criterion. That, in this situation, would be our measure of efficiency. Kim's husband is a behavior analyst and is always trying to give her advice on how to respond when their toddler starts to display challenging behavior. Kim's husband is always reminding her to reinforce alternative behaviors when in challenging situations. Kim's husband is promoting what? Let's think about this, right? It's kind of vague, and we're looking at Kim's husband. We know Kim's husband is a behavior analyst, so he is practicing behavior analysis and behavior analysis strategies. He's telling Kim, always reinforce alternative behaviors when in challenging, challenging situations. That is a very behavior analytic thing to do, right? And so what is Kim's husband promoting? A, being effective. Well, effectiveness is going to depend on what they're trying to accomplish. We don't know if challenging behavior is going up, going down, their goals. It's hard to say whether or not Kim's husband is promoting being effective. All we know is she, he is telling Kim to use ABA strategies like reinforcing alternative behaviors. C, being analytical. Kim's husband doesn't mention anything about a functional relationship. He's just telling her, use the strategies. C, being applied. We're not talking about social validity here, right? We have a situation where Kim needs to deal with challenging behaviors, and Kim's husband says, use this strategy all the time. Kim's husband is telling Kim to be conceptually systematic. Your dimension questions and assumption questions might look like this. Pretty vague, not a lot of information. You're just going to have to be as precise as possible and really think about what is presented in the question. In this case, Kim's husband is telling Kim, use strategies all the time. Be conceptually systematic. Julian designs two interventions that he believes will be effective for teaching his client how to independently get ready for the day. Julian wants to involve the client, but he also wants to pick the best intervention. Which answer choice represents a proper cost-benefit analysis related to Julian's issue? When we're conducting a cost-benefit analysis, what are we doing? You are weighing the benefits against the cost of a choice. So, for instance, if you have to study for an exam, but you want to go out with your friends, the, the benefit of going out with your friends is you might have a good time, you might meet somebody, you might have a memorable, memorable night. The cost is you might feel bad the next morning. You might not properly study for that exam. You might fail that exam. That's the cost-benefit analysis. So for Julian, he has two interventions that he thinks will be effective. He wants to involve the client, but he wants the best intervention. So if he's going to conduct a cost-benefit analysis, he needs to take these interventions and, and compare them and, and think about what is the benefit of each and how do I involve the client? but I also want the best one. So what's the cost of picking one over the other? Let's look at A. Julian evaluates both interventions based on how much time each will take as to implement, as well as client preference versus the level of independence they will produce for the client. This seems like a pretty good cost-benefit analysis, right? How much time is going to take? He's taking into consideration client preference. And then what level of effectiveness will they produce? A looks good. Read all of our answer choices. B, Julian asks the client to choose the intervention they prefer and implements that intervention first. Well, that's not a cost benefit. He's just asking the client to choose. 
C, Julian picks the intervention that requires the least amount of time and resources. That might be the cost analysis, right? We're looking at the least amount of time and resources, but where is the benefit analysis here? Just because it's the easiest doesn't mean it's going to benefit. And then D, Julian implements both interventions simultaneously, strictly to see which one works better. That is just a brute force strategy where we're just trying it out. A proper cost-benefit analysis analyzes the different aspects of each intervention and then compares them, both the cost and the benefits. You hire a Spanish tutor to teach you how to speak Spanish in preparation for a trip you're taking next year. You meet with the tutor three times a week and are assigned homework outside of those weekly meetings. In addition, you have also started watching Spanish soap operas, which you think is helping develop your language. The soap operas are potentially blank in relation to the functional relationship with the tutoring sessions. So earlier we talked about independent, independent variables. Independent variables are what we are manipulating, what we're introducing. Dependent variables are our target behaviors, what we're trying to change. Now, in this case, you have a Spanish tutor. You're learning to speak Spanish. So that's likely your dependent variable. The Spanish tutor is giving you homework and meetings. That's going to be the independent variable. That's going to have the effect on you speaking Spanish. However, you've also watched Spanish soap operas. Now, if those soap operas are not part of the tutor's intervention plan, what could they potentially be? Well, if they aren't part of the tutoring sessions and the plan, then they might be considered confounds. Confounds are variables that we aren't controlling, but that are affecting our dependent variable. So if the tutor and the tutoring sessions aren't controlling the soap operas, but those are having an effect on your behavior, then those would be considered confounds. A graph indicates the frequency of a tennis player's unforced errors is high and stable during a baseline data collection phase. When the coach introduces a new practice routine, a decreasing trend and a change in level is observed on the graph. What does the graph suggest about the effect of the practice routine? So it's a visual analysis question. You could probably do this without drawing it out, but since we are practicing, let's just map it out. We're looking at what the graph suggests about the effect of the routine. So we have our graph. And at first, we have a high and stable level or frequency of unforced errors. This is baseline. Then the routine's introduced, and we see a decreasing trend and then a change in level. What does that imply about the intervention's effectiveness if this is frequency? A, the practice routine may have had an effect on unforced errors. Yeah, there's a good chance there is some change due to the introduction of the intervention because it's clear the frequency changed. Now, we haven't done any reversals. We've done no fun functional control checks, functional relationship checks, so we can't say for sure, but there's a chance. B, the practice routine had no effect on unforced errors. Well, that's not what our visual analysis implies. It looks like there was a change. C, the practice routine has a functional relationship with unforced errors. We don't know that yet. Remember, we just talked about confounds. All we have are two conditions, a baseline and an intervention. What if something else was changed once we introduced intervention and we have no control over the behavior? We don't have enough information to say for sure there's a functional relationship. And then D, not enough data to interpret the effect of the practice routine. Well, that's not true. We can start to say, all right, this looks to be some effect, right? Now we're going to try to reverse it or we're going to try to test out that functional relationship to better identify potential functional relationships. What is not a reason you would use a behavior chain? At, what is not a reason you would use a behavior chain interruption strategy? Excuse me. See, sometimes even I stumble over questions, which is why we read our questions slow and why we attack the question. Now, it's a behavior chain interruption strategy question, and it's a not question. So, what is not a reason? you would use an interruption strategy. Remember, with an interruption strategy, the chain is already relatively known. We've mastered the essential pieces of the chain. Now we're going to change something in the chain to get new behaviors to come out to promote generalization and response generalization, where we're seeing new behaviors that aren't part of the initial chain. So what will we not use this strategy for? A, to increase the frequency of training a specific step 
within the behavior chain by interrupting the flow and prompting a response. B, to create an opportunity for the individual to engage in a new behavior, such as demanding for assistance. C, to teach the learner how to perform a previously unknown step in the chain by breaking down the process into smaller components. And then D, to disrupt the chain in order to increase variability in responding and build more complex communication skills. Now, long answer choices, but let's just think about the purpose of the chain interruption. We're, we want to see new behaviors, right? We're trying to get new behaviors evoked, and we want to try to interrupt in a strategic spot. So would A, increase the frequency of training a step within the chain by interrupting the flow and prompting response, be a strategy? It could be. If we want to train something specific within the chain, we might break up the chain at that point, and so we can work on that specific response that follows. B, to create an opportunity for the individual to engage in a new behavior, such as demanding for assistance. B is absolutely one of the primary reasons we would use this, to get that new behavior. C, to teach the learner how to perform a previously unknown step in the chain by breaking down the process into smaller components. The interruption strategy is not used to teach the unknown steps. We need most of the steps and all the essential steps already mastered. So the purpose of the chain interruption is not to teach unknown steps. And then D, to disrupt the chain in order to increase variability in responding and build more complex communication skills. That's just a fancy way of saying we want to see new responses. What the chain interruption strategy is not for is to teach the unknown steps by breaking it down into even smaller components. Challenging question, right? Requires a lot of careful reading and thought to get through this one. A behavior analyst is training a new technician to implement a discrete trial procedure. The analyst measures how long it takes from the beginning of training until the technician can run the procedure independently without any prompting. What efficiency measure is the analyst using? All right, we're once again measuring efficiency. And don't get confused or worried about this idea of measuring efficiency. It's just a measurement, right? You just ask yourself, what am I measuring? What am I using to measure? The analyst is, is measuring how long it takes from the beginning of training until the technician can run the procedure independently. So basically, we start training, how long does it take to teach the, the technician to do it by themselves? What would we call that? Hey, a cost-benefit analysis. Well, again, we're not comparing benefits and costs in this particular setup. B, trials to criterion. Remember our distinction, how long versus how many. This is going to be time, not a count. What we're looking at here is training duration. What is the duration of training? How long does it take for the technician to learn how to do the procedure? You have trouble sleeping at night, so you begin taking melatonin, which is supposed to reduce restless nights. You, experiencing, you experience varying results the first couple of nights, so you conduct a parametric analysis. What are you trying to determine? The only thing that matters here is the analysis that you are conducting. What is a parametric analysis used to, to determine? It's used to determine dosage. If we have intervention A, we want to know how much or how little of that intervention to use. That is what a parametric, parametric analysis is for. It's not used to determine accuracy. It's not used for effectiveness or reliability. A parametric analysis is all about the dosage. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and share. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.